Hello everyone, welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret, and today we are in the book of Zephaniah, our second and final study through the book of Zephaniah brings us to chapter 2, and we left off in verse 4, so we'll pick it up in verse 5. Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 5, grab your Bible, open it up to the book of Zephaniah so that you can follow along verse by verse. The scripture verse by verse website can be found at the Bible verse by verse dot com. I do hope you check it out. If you are hungry for the Word of God, you can certainly be fed there because you can study the entire Bible verse by verse using my audio Bible commentaries from Genesis through Revelation verse by verse. That's at the Bible verse by verse dot com. Zephaniah chapter 2. Let's begin our reading in verse number 1. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. And here's a very important admonition, sort of a, a last-ditch effort by God. Verse 3, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. If you're alive, if you're still breathing, it's not too late for you to have your soul saved. Your body may be shot. You may be destined for death. You might be in the middle of God's judgment, and it will not be reversed on this earth. But you can avoid going to hell if you repent and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Verse 4, For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. And as I said last time, Ashdod was the center of Dagon worship. The Israelites were really into the worship of Dagon, and so God is going to destroy it. You get rid of your sin, one way or another. You'll either do it through repentance or he'll remove it or he'll just remove your ability to commit it. But he's not putting up with it forever, I'll guarantee you that. Verse 5, Woe unto the inhabitants of the sea coast, the nation of the Cherith Heights. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will even destroy thee that there shall be no inhabitant. It is, it is going to be a sad time for the Philistines who live along the Mediterranean Sea. God is against them and he will destroy them until no one is living there anymore. Verse 6, And the sea coast shall be dwellings and cottages for shepherds and folds for flocks. The large cities of the Philistines will be turned into pasture lands. 7. And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon in the houses of Ashkelon. Shall they lie down in the evening, for the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. And so God will give that land to the remnant of his people who return from their captivity in Babylon. They're going to be there 70 years, but they will be brought back. And then God says, that land will be yours. Verse 8, I have heard the reproach of Moab, 
and the revelings of the children of Ammon, whereby they have reproached my people and magnified themselves against their border. The countries of Moab and Ammon had often threatened to take territory from Israel. God heard those threats and he didn't like it. And so it says in verse 9, Therefore as I live, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom, and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding of nettles and salt pits, and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. And so God will make all these things happen because as he says here, he is the Lord Almighty. That means he is the supreme ruler of all the nations of the world. God makes the rules and God enforces them. Verse 10, this shall they have for their pride because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of the Lord of hosts. And so because God's people were mocked and insulted, they will receive the land that belonged to those who insulted and mocked them. God, God plays fair. Now, he doesn't always do things right away, as you well know. But he does play fair in the end. Everyone gets a square deal. Verse 11. The Lord will be terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth, and men shall worship him, everyone from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. And so by the time God gets through punishing people for putting other things before him, Everyone will know for certain that he alone is the Lord. Verse 12, ye Ethiopians also, ye shall be slain by my sword. And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria and will make Nineveh a desolation and dry like a wilderness. Nineveh did become utterly desolate just as the Word of God says so right here. Its location was unknown until it was uncovered through excavations, not much more than, or not much, uh, yeah, not much more than a hundred or so years ago from the time of this recording. Verse 14, And flocks shall lie down in the midst of her, all the beasts of the nations, both the Camerite, and the bittern shall lodge in the upper lintels of it. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the thresholds, for he shall uncover the cedar work. The great and wealthy city of Nineveh became a wilderness, the home of wild animals. And they never thought it could happen to them, but it did. Isn't that the same old line that Satan hands every sinner? It'll never happen to you because, and then fill in the blank, it'll never happen to you. Sodom and Gomorrah were completely destroyed and the people sent to hell, but it'll never happen to us. Judas died and went to his own place, the Bible said. Jesus said it would have been good for that man if he had never been born. You know, me, you know what that means. You know where he went. And you say, but it'll never happen to me. And you do realize that 100,000 people on average die every day. Most of them didn't know they were going to die. And the vast, vast majority of them will burn in hell forever and they started today and it will never stop and many of them said it'll never happen to me 
but it will if you reject Christ. Verse 15. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly. They dealt, dwelt I should say, in a worry-free manner. What do I have to worry about was their attitude that said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. How has she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down? Everyone that passeth by her shall hiss and wag his head. Assyria's boasting was something that rightly belonged to the Lord God. And they boasted of themselves. And God says, I am, and there is none besides me. For a nation or anyone to say that of themselves is blasphemy. To think that you are the superior one. To think that you are a self-made man or a self-made woman. Or you're a nation and you don't need God because you got all these things going for you. Or you're an individual and you don't need God because you got all these things going for you. And that's why you don't pray and you don't read the Bible and you don't think about repentance. You don't think about anything because after all, you got it pretty well right now. You are boasting. If not with your mouth, then with your attitude. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And for you to have that attitude is blasphemy. Chapter 3. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted, to the oppressing city. And the city in view here is Jerusalem. God is condemning it for its sin. Violence against the innocent had become normal. Verse 2. And this was supposed to be in the city of God. Verse 2, she obeyed not the voice, she received not correction, she trusted not in the Lord, she drew not near to her God. Jerusalem had been disciplined by God for her own good many, many times. You can read, especially in the book of Judges, where there was a constant up and down, spiritually speaking, of the Israelites with judgment following every downturn in their walk with the Lord. They were constantly being disciplined. They would learn their lesson for a little while when it really got painful, but then they would fall right back into sin. And so they just never learned their lesson. They just became more and more cold toward God Verse 3, her princes within her are roaring lions. She, her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. And so the rulers had an appetite for hurting anyone that they could get away with hurting. If they could get something out of the deal, they didn't mind doing it because it was all about self. They didn't care what God thought about anything. Remember? They didn't think that God saw. They didn't think that God cared. We saw that last time. He's not going to judge our sin. He doesn't even know about it. He doesn't pay attention to that. After all, you know, we're God's people. Oh yeah, yeah. Just like some people today are Christians. I'm a born-again Christian. I'm in good shape. God's not going to hold my sins against me. I'm not worried about it. Well, you know what? The fact that you're not even concerned about it tells me you're not even a Christian. So you better worry about it. Verse 4. Her prophets are light. That means they're rec reckless. They're frivolous. That's her, her prophets are frivolous. They didn't take anything seriously including the Word of God. It just makes me sick. When I hear preachers or see preachers who treat the Word of God lightly, 
and treat sin lightly and joke. Running around on stage acting like a bunch of idiots. Immature. Brats. Self-seeking. Entertainers. Or intellectuals trying to draw people's attention to the Greek word for all means all. Or other, some other such nonsense. All it is is an attempt to draw attention to self. So, it says in verse 4 that her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. And so the priest who should have led by example, desecrated the holy temple by not conducting the holy rites the way God instructed them to do it in his word. Instead of being guard the guardians of God's law and the worship of God, they broke the law of God themselves. Verse 5, The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. So on the other hand, God doesn't do anything wrong. The prophets don't care. They're just a bunch of giggly little girls. The priests are corrupt. But in contrast to those would-be spiritual leaders, God doesn't do anything wrong. And that's bad news for the prophets and the priests. So he doesn't do anything wrong. The problem is that the people of Jerusalem were not influenced either by the example of God or by the example of his people, influenced in a good way. The example of his leadership wasn't there. And they were not, they were not influenced also by God's punishment. Verse 6, I have cut off the nations, their towers are desolate, I made their streets waste, that none passeth by their cities are destroyed, so that there is no man, that there is none inhabitant. So as a way of warning Israel, God has punished the wicked nations around them as an example of what's going to happen to them if they don't repent. But you know, they, they didn't learn from that either. They just were stubborn and rebellious and implacable and teachable. Verse 7, I said, Surely thou wilt fear me, thou wilt receive instruction so their dwelling should not be cut off howsoever I punish them but they rose early and corrupted all their doings God hoped that his warning shots would be heeded so that he wouldn't have to punish but instead of getting better they actually got worse and part of the problem that made it even worse was that they sinned against more light. God gave them more light and they just continued to sin against it. Made their guilt even worse too. You know, when a sinner ignores God's warnings, in every sense of the word, they go from bad to worse. Verse 8, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to pray, to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. So for those who will repent, God has a word for them. It's probably not what they wanted to hear exactly, but God's word to them was, wait, be patient, wait 
and live by faith. Because once evil runs its course, God says, I'm going to put an end to it forever. And I'm going to punish all those who would not repent. But you repent, you just hang in there. Because it's going to go well with you. And that's true of every age. Verse 9. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. <clears throat> well, God, God's punishment on the wicked will result in his people being purified. Now his people will just be a small remnant but they will be purified. The trouble that destroys the wicked purifies the righteous. The trouble that destroys the wicked purifies the righteous because it draws them closer to Jesus and it causes them to repent of their sin and get closer and closer to God. Verse 10. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. People from all over will worship the Lord God. Jesus ordered his church to go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. He said, preach the gospel the gospel of salvation to every creature and then baptize them and make disciples of them. Teach them the word of God from start to finish. So in that sense, this scripture has been in the process of being fulfilled for 2,000 years. Verse 11. In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. God says, you will not feel shame someday. Why? Because you're going to stop being prideful, and instead you're going to humbly submit to my reign. My reign, which is abundant in mercy. Verse 12. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. In other words, those who understand their total dependence upon the grace and mercy of God. That's what this is referring to. Talking about people who put all their hope and their confidence in the Lord, not in themselves. They are the ones who will be blessed in the long run. Verse 13. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. True Christians, and that includes believing Jews as well as believing Gentiles, believing Hebrews as well as believing Gentiles, will do no wrong. And what does that mean? Sinless perfection? No. Meaning they're, meaning they're not they're not willfully, they will not willfully be a servant of sin. And if you're a Christian, you are not willfully a servant of sin. You may slip into it. You may fall into sin. Yes. But willfully turn your back on Jesus? If you do, you're not a Christian. And that's who this verse is referring to. Verse 14. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Good times of great joy will follow after holiness. It's just the natural progression of things. Verse 13 talked about Christians who do not willfully turn their back on Jesus. They fall into sin. Yes, everyone does. 
but turn their back on Jesus, turn their back on the Word of God, and willfully go head first, full blast into sin? No, not if you're a real Christian. And if you are a real Christian, well then, verse 14 is true too. Good times of great joy will follow you because it always happens when people are holy. Verse 15, the Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. The King of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. And so when Israel has paid the temporary penalty of her sin by their exile, God's justice is going to be satisfied and they will be given a clean slate with the Lord as it were. Verse 16. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. In other words, do not be discouraged, says God. If you're a Christian today, don't be discouraged. Hang in there. Cling to the word of God. Cling. Remember, God has called us to live by his promises, not by experience. Verse 17, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. God delights in a restored relationship with sinners as much as the sinners do. Nah, I take that back. You think you feel good when you repent of your sin and you confess your sin to God. You think you feel good. Well, so does he. Even more. Verse 18. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Those who were exiled far away from the place of worship in Jerusalem will be brought back and will, and they're going to appreciate what they had lost because you always appreciate, you know, what you lose. Sin steals your joy, sin steals your happiness, and you know you repent and it feels so good. You confess and it feels so good just to be back in fellowship with Jesus again. It just backsliding doesn't pay, you know, and it's no comparison to a holy walk with the Lord as far as joy goes. Verse 19, Behold, at that time I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that halteth, and gather her that was driven out, and I will get them praise, and I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. There's coming a time when God's people will no longer be persecuted, but instead they're going to be celebrated. With God's people, always remember this, with God's people, it is always this. Bad now, for a while, but good in the future and forever. 20. At that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you, for I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. And so the fulfillment of this verse, the ultimate fulfillment, is found in the church of Jesus Christ. God, God gathers his elect from all over the world and brings them into his church. The complete fulfillment is going to take place when Jesus returns and creates a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness is actually the norm. I'm out of time. We completed the book of Zephaniah. Next time, Haggai, and you can continue to study the Word of God long after I sign off here. You can go to the Scripture Verse by Verse website and study the entire Bible online using my audio Bible commentaries. Just click on the book you want to study, click on the chapter, open your Bible, listen and follow along as I teach it verse by verse. Again, that's found at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. And if the Word of God blesses you, just please keep in mind, that we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support. This is a ministry that is not underwritten by a large church or denomination for over 30 years. It never has been and it never will be. I give out the word of God and those who are blessed pray and contribute. And I pray 
that you would at least ask God if there's anything that he would have you do. You can give in a secure method at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click on the donate button at the top of the front page and give as the Lord may lead. Please pray for this ministry. I pray for you. I pray for all my listeners every morning. It's one of the first things I do when I get up. Have a great day. I'll see you next time in the book of Haggai. Until then, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.